name is Nicole Smarland, and I'm a professor of criminology and director of the centre, which is based uh, in the School of Applied Social Sciences here at Durham. Thank you all uh, very much for coming out on this staff evening to um, listen to um, a topic which I think is very much increasing generally in terms of people's interest and certainly in terms of um, the work that we're doing here in the centre and the people that we've got involved, uh, something that's, that's very important to cross to our hearts at the moment. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Stephen Burrell, who is a postgraduate researcher within the school, who's done uh, most of the organisation for today. And he's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so yeah, hi everybody. And uh, yeah, I would just like to say that you know, uh, on behalf of Prima, that we're very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Michael Flood, um, who's an associate professor in sociology at the University of Wollongong in Australia, and um, he's an Australian Research Council Future Fellow, and he's also the co-founder and co-director uh, of the Centre for Research on Men and Masculinities at the University of Wollongong, um, and that's the first research centre in Australia focused on this field of scholarship. Um, and Dr. Flood is a researcher and an educator who's made a significant uh, contribution to both scholarship on and community understanding of violence against women. Um, and he's recognized as a leading voice internationally on efforts to engage men in preventing violence against women and building a world of gender justice. Um, and he's published a wide variety of papers on these, on these different issues and on other topics, including uh, young men's heterosexual relations, fathering, pornography, anti-feminist men's groups, and homophobia. Um, and Dr. Flood is also a trainer and a community educator with long involvement in community advocacy, activism, and education work focused on men's violence against women. And as Nicole says, um, he'll be talking to us today about one of the kind of prime focuses of his research, which is gender equality, and the role that men can play in helping to build it, and also what some of the implications are of involving men in this kind of work. Uh, he's going to speak for around about 40 minutes, um, and there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussion after that, and we'll have to finish the event by 6.30. Uh, please don't be afraid to help yourself to tea, coffee, and uh, cake, um, and afterwards we will go for a drink, so if anybody wants to join us, just hang around at the end. And, and please just note that we are filming uh, Michael's talk with a video camera up there, but we'll switch that off uh, at the end of his presentation, so don't be afraid that you won't be recording me asking questions or anything. That's it, so thank you. I was just going to say, we haven't had a Christmas lunch today, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> 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 it's not too dark. Can you still, can you kind of see each other? You can see what's in front of you? Anyway. Um, Yes, we lose the top third or so. So thank you um, to Nicole and Stephen uh, for that welcome, and also for really uh, for being lovely, lovely hosts over the sort of day and a half I've been at Durham. How I came to be in this country at all was there's a conference um, coming up in Cambridge this weekend called Political Masculinities, which is about sort of men and gender and gender politics. And Stephen's going, and I'm going, and a few others. And I thought, having come all this way, which for those of you who don't know, it's 14 hours plus another eight hours. Um, just on planes and then there's sort of other bits of travel. So it's a long way. I thought, you know, it would be crazy not to make contact with, um, uh, with Creeper and with other sort of academics in the area. So I've sort of turned this into a bit of a world in speaking to it. Um, so what I'm going, to, I'm going to do today, as Stephen suggested, um, is really give a kind of what's meant to be an accessible, practical talk about men and gender equality. And I'm going to ask some really simple questions. Um, what role do men have in progress towards gender equality? Is gender equality good for men? Is it bad for men? And so on. And just to say a little bit about me, Stephen's already done so, but um, yes, I'm an academic, so that means I'm good at reading and writing. Um, and you know, uh, summarising other people's work is one of my particular skills. And uh, at the moment, I'm doing research particularly on engaging men in violence prevention, but I've sort of had fingers in other pies as well. Uh, I've also been an activist, and in fact that's really how I came to these issues, was through, uh, was through student activism. And um, I've had a long involvement in groups and networks and campaigns um, focused on men and gender, men and violence and so on. And in fact, one of the things I've been very happy to do while I've been here in the UK is work with White Ribbon UK. White Ribbon, for those of you who don't know, is a campaign focused on the positive role men can play in stopping violence against women, and White Ribbon UK is active in that work. And I've also been an educator, a community educator, um, working with young people, with nurses, with doctors, social workers, and so on. And I'm not telling you all that just to say, you know, I'm amazing at all three of those things, but I don't think I am, but just to give you a sense of some of the sort of stuff I've done. 
Um, okay, so men and gender. Um, so there's growing interest uh, in, in this country and globally in men's roles in fostering gender equality. And so I kind of the first question to ask is, well, hang on, isn't gender just about women? Isn't that what, you know, when we say gender issues, mean, we mean women's issues. What do men have to do with this? And there's kind of three crucial insights that I think um, it's important to keep in mind. One is, um, the first one of those, is that men are gendered, just as women are. That men's lives are shaped, just as much as women's are, by gender, by gender constructions, by gender relations. Gender often has been code for women, but in fact, men too are gendered beings. So um, I think I've got a really simple definition of gender there. Gender means the meanings we give to being male and female and the social organisation of men's and women's lives. So gender includes our categories. And indeed, it's increasingly visible now that people don't necessarily fit into categories, for example, of male and female. Um, gender includes the meanings and values we give to those categories. Gender includes the behaviours and identities that members of those categories are meant to adopt. It includes our images and cultural representations of women and men. And it includes how the lives of those people um, are organised in terms of power and work and so on. So, for example, when we tell boys to be tough or to man up or stop behaving like such a girl, when we allow girls, on the other hand, to be weak or afraid, we're teaching about gender. When young men at Durham, who are highly sexually active and have had lots of sex, are given status and praise, while young women at Durham um, who've had lots of sex or seem to have had lots of sex are shamed and punished, we're teaching about gender. Uh, in a thousand different ways, really, through families, through university, through church, through government, through uh, media and so on, people's lives are shaped by gender. So the first insight that's fueled this interest in men and gender is that men's lives are gender. Gender means men as much as it does women. Um, so, you know, I think I've got a couple of brackets here. This is a kind of word cloud. Uh, if you look online, for example, at, at the terms men or masculine, you get this kind of, you know, very stereotypical list of the kinds of qualities that people with penises are meant to embody. Um, and if we look at popular culture too, uh, again, we can see a series of kind of consistent themes in how men are represented. Now, they're shifting in interesting ways, um, but there are nevertheless some very dominant <coughs> themes. Um, so that's one part. The second part of it is that uh, this two for, uh, is a second insight that many men play a role in maintaining gender inequality. And the third one, which I'll get to in a moment, is that men have a role to play in building a world of gender equality. So in other words, men are part of the problem, but men are also part of the solution. Um, I should check, can I use the F word? Can I do that? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about feminism. Um, so I've said men are part of the problem, part of the solution. Another way to put this is that feminism needs men. In fact, feminism needs men, and later I'll say that men need feminism. So I come from Australia, I'm sure, I'm sure whether you've been there or not, you've got some sort of stereotypes about what it means to be Australian. Um, and if you look at the data, certainly Australia is a gender unequal society. There are widespread patterns of gender inequality in patterns of political power, economic decision making, cultural representation, and so on. That's certainly true in Australia, it's true here as well. And I spent a moment looking at the stats for the UK. So, for example, economic decision making, women are 7% of the members of boards of companies, the largest companies in the UK. There are also inequalities in political power in the UK. Women are 22% of government ministers. And so I'm not going to go through um, any more stats, but the point I want to make is that we won't make much progress towards gender equality without men's support. Not because women are weak, not because poor men have been left out and are now the victims, but because men are part of the problem. Gender inequality is fundamentally a men's problem. It's the problem of men in this room, men in this country. And if we look at how gender inequalities work, how they're sustained, how they reproduce day by day, one really key thing that keeps gender inequalities alive is men, is men's behaviours, men's identities, men's ideas, how men relate to women, how men relate to other men. So when we talk about gender inequality, it's often understood in terms of women's disadvantage, but it's just as much a story of male advantage. So think, for example, um, of our women's exclusion from economic and political life, the fact that only, women are only 7% of the members of boards of the UK top companies, we think, well, who, who else is in the room? So the 93% are men. Men are 93% of the bosses of those companies. Um, and in fact, I saw a statistic last year uh, which makes this particularly clear. 
Um, it was this statistic, that there are more men in the US named John running big companies than there are women with any name. Um, and in case, in case you think that's just some crazy Trump thing, um, the same is true in the UK. In the UK, 17% of the bosses of companies are called John. Okay? 17%, whereas about, I think, 9% of the bosses of companies are women of any name. And so, what we're talking about is a pattern of male advantage. Now, of course, it's not any men. Those men called John are overwhelmingly likely to be white, heterosexual, uh, economically privileged men. Um, so, there's a pattern here of privilege, of male privilege and female disadvantage. Now, this all may seem, and um, another graphic as well, um, you know, there's sort of ostensible equality. Quit whining, it's the same distance. Now, he faces, you know, relatively few hurdles relative to her, um, landmines, barbed wire, crocodiles, and so on. Just want to check that I'm not skipping any graphics. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Good. Okay. So, this all may seem a bit abstract, a bit distant, but in fact, male privilege is personal. Male privilege is every day. Most men, many men, most men, do sexism in our everyday lives. So, to get personal for a moment, I'm a nice guy, I'm a good lad, a good bloke, whatever term you want to use, I've not engaged in the bluntest forms of men's power over women. I've never forced a woman into sex, I've never um, you know, physically assaulted a woman. Um, but in countless ways, like most men, I've perpetuated sexism and I've benefited from privilege. In meetings, for example, I've sometimes left meetings um, and left women to do the washing up and the tidying up. It's just been invisible to me. I've sometimes whined and whinged when a girlfriend didn't want sex. I've assumed that a woman will take responsibility for contraception and STI protection. Um, I've looked at pornography, which shows women in callous and hostile ways. I've said nothing sometimes when male friends have offered sexist or derogatory comments about women. And they're all examples of doing privilege, of doing sexism in our everyday lives. And in fact, even if we don't want to, even if men don't want to benefit from sexism and privilege, we still do. We benefit. When I open my mouth, my views often will be given more weight uh, than the views of a woman. Um, and in fact, people have done great experiments where uh, in matched groups of um, university students, they get a man reading out a lecture and a woman reading out a lecture. And it's the very same text um, about gender and sexism and so on. Um, and the man reading the lecture, he's perceived by the students, oh, you know, he had some reasonable points to make. But the woman reading that lecture, she's much more likely to be heard as nasty, man-hating, feminazi, even though they're reading exactly the same text. Um, and when I send in my CV as a man, if my CV has a male name on it, which it would unless I've only used my initials, then I'm obviously as more competent, more employable than a woman with the same skills and experience. I can turn on the news and see members of my sex routinely represented in positive ways, their achievements celebrated and lauded and so on. But this privilege is naturalised, it's normalised, it's not visible. And so I and other men um, think that our achievements, our, um, you know, our CVs are the result of our efforts and our skill, not the unearned advantages of an unequal system. Now, I focused here on men. Yes, women too prop up gender inequalities. Women too subscribe to traditional and sexist ideas about, about women and men and gender and so on. But I think the bigger problem is men's. Okay, that's all really a bit confronting, maybe a bit disheartening, a bit depressing. And it's not meant to be, because there's good news as well. I've said feminism needs men, feminism needs men to change, it needs men to make change. But the good news is that men are already doing that. Many men um, are already playing a role in building gender equality. Men are part of the solution. So, if we look around, um, we see in fact that fair numbers of men already live in gender just ways. They respect and care for the women and girls in their lives and they reject sexist norms of manhood. So just out of curiosity, how many of you know at least one man who consistently behaves in uh, non-sexist and respectful and gender equitable ways to the women in his lives? Hands up if um, you know at least one man. I hope you're not all thinking of the same man. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, that's encouraging. I think all of us have encountered um, those men. And some men are already playing a public role in fostering gender equality as well. Men in trade unions, men in government organisations. Uh, and there are small numbers of men involved in public advocacy in support of gender equality. I think, for example, in this country of White Ribbon UK, I've already mentioned, also organisations like A Call to Men, the Great Men Initiative, and a number of other initiatives as well. 
And there's been enormous growth in work with men around the world, and it is fueled by an optimism, a kind of hope for um, men's roles in building gender equality. And I want to argue very much that men have a stake. Men have a stake in this work that men will gain from gender equality. And in, in this sense, that men need feminism. So let's look at how. One of the ways that men need feminism is that because without it, we will be stuck. We will be stuck in what we might call the act like a man box. And the act like a man box is full of fairly rigid ideas around how men should behave. Men should be stoic, men should be strong, men should not show pain, men should be, um, men shouldn't show emotion other than anger, um, men should, uh, you know, be uh, sort of uh, physically powerful and so on. And that, that, that set of prescriptions, if men are expected to, to follow those things all the time and um, in, in every context, that's not very good for our health. It's not very good for our relations with others. It's not very good for our emotional and physical health. So the act like a man box is suffocating. It's unhealthy. Um, it tells us that boys don't cry, that men are lords of the household, that violence is acceptable as a way to solve problems, that women are better than men at caring for children, that gay is bad, and so on. And those messages hurt women, no doubt, but they also limit men. And feminism frees men from that. Feminism questions those things and argues that those ideas are socially constructed, that in fact women and men can be all kinds of people in all kinds of ways, um, and that we're not limited by biology or testosterone and so on. And feminism is passionately <coughs> anti-sexist. It's not anti-male, it's anti-sexist. Um, and to focus on some ways in which feminism is good for men. Feminism is good for men's health. Um, there have been a whole series of studies that consistently show that if you're a man who goes along with traditional masculinity, if you conform to traditional masculinity, you're more likely to have poor health. More likely to have poor health because you take risks, because you don't follow doctor's advice, you don't seek doctor's advice, you um, ignore pain and injury and so on. In other words, men who believe that men should be 10 feet tall and bulletproof tend to have poorer health. Men pay heavy costs in terms of high rates of injury, early death, and so on. So feminism is good for men's health. Feminism is also good for men's working and family lives. Some of you may be, uh, some of the men in this room may be fathers, or may be planning on being fathers, or may be fathers whether or not you plan to be. And if you want choices about, um, you know, caring for children and being involved with children, then feminism is a good thing, because feminism opens up choices for women and men about how to organise parenting and family life. Feminism is also good for men's friendships. It makes more room for friendships with women and with other men that are intimate, that are, that are trusting and close and so on. And feminism is good for men's sexual and relationship lives. Um, just focusing on women for a moment, feminist women have better sex than non-feminist women. There's data I can show you. Um, feminist women tend to be more assertive. Surprise, surprise. Feminist women tend to be more in touch with their own pleasure and their own bodies and better expressing their sexual desires and their sexual limits, and thus end up having better sex than non-feminist women. And the male partners of feminist women, and they tend to be feminist too, but not always, um, have better sex as well, typically because they're good at establishing consent. They're less likely to pressure a partner into sex. They're better at intimacy, and they respect and care for women. Um, I think I said more about this on the next page, actually. Um, and in fact, there's been a series of studies comparing men with feminist partners and men with non-feminist partners, and comparing women with feminist male partners with women with non-feminist male partners. And um, we find, for example, that men with feminist partners have more stable relationships and greater sexual satisfaction than men with non-feminist partners. So, I mean, I almost, you know, could almost be saying, hey, men date feminists. It's not quite as simple as that, but no, I think there's some value there. And women with feminist male partners have the same, more stable relationships, greater sexual satisfaction, and so on. So, um, so one question that comes up here is, well, you know, why should men promote gender equality? Why should men support gender equality? And I've given you one reason, that it's in men's interests to do so. It's in men's interests that men will gain from progress with gender equality. There's probably a more pressing, a more primary reason that it's, it's the right thing to do. Gender inequalities are unfair by definition. They're unjust, they're oppressive. And if we receive unfair or unjust privileges, we have an ethical obligation to do something about that. That's just what's right. That's just what's fair. And second, men, men ourselves will benefit. So to spend a bit more time on how men ourselves will benefit, there are four kinds of gain. 
One is about the ways in which our own lives are limited by narrow constructions of masculinity, and I've already told you a bit about that. Second, there's men's relational interests. What kinds of lives do the men in this room want for the women and girls in your lives? What kind of lives do you want for your sister, your girlfriend, your friend, your female friends, your mums, and so on? Do you want lives for men that are free of violence, that involve the same opportunities that men have, or do you want you know, more constrained lives for them? And when women and girls benefit, men benefit too. In part because most men and boys live in some kind of social relationships with women and girls, and when women and girls' lives are better, so are men's and boys. Third, there's kind of our collective interests. So the question here is what kind of communities do we want? What kind of society do we want? And gender equality is good for, good for our communities. Um, our communities benefit, for example, from more flexible divisions of labour, where the kind of pools of skill and talent that both women and men have can be, you know, can be invested in paid work, paid work, where there's more flexibility around who stays at home, who cares for children, and so on. Our communities benefit from improvements in women's health and well-being, and so on. So, is gender equality good for men? Absolutely, no doubt. Um, is gender equality also bad for men? I don't think so, in general. But there are some things men will have to lose. Some things men will have to give up. So if we go back to those corporate boardrooms, or we go back to the, you know, the halls of parliament, um, if 93% of the members of corporate boardrooms are men, if, whatever it was, 78% uh, of the members of um, the halls of parliament in this country are men, some of those men are going to have to leave the room. Some of those men are going to have to step out for women to be 50% of those people. Men will have to share economic and political power with women. Now, is that a loss? I don't think it's an unfair loss. It's a loss of unfair privileges. It's a loss of unearned advantages. And it would mean, for example, that when I apply for a job, um, I will be judged in the same ways uh, as I would judge as competent on the same level as a woman with the same skills, the same CV. When I'm in a relationship, it means that I'll no longer be able to assume that my sexual needs come first. I'll actually have to pay attention to what my partner wants, what she'd like to do or not want to do. I won't be able to get away with doing far less housework uh, and caring work than my female partner, and so on. So, in a sense, that's a loss, but it's a loss of unfair privileges, of unfair advantages, I would argue. So, it's not a hardship, it's about what's fair, what's right. So, so far I've been talking about the idea that men have a vital role to play in building gender equality. And, in fact, that idea is firmly on um, government gender. So, I forgot to show you this. When you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. It can actually be quite upsetting or confronting when, um, you know, when we're asked to share power, or asked to give up an um, advantage. And it's not because we're suddenly men are now the victims, but it's because um, the privileges that we've been used to are now having to give way. So I want you to get used to this idea of, you know, feminist men. Anyway. Um, okay. So there has been a real turn to men in gender politics, uh, a growing emphasis on the role that men can play. Um, in building gender equality. Now, it's not a new idea. Um, hundreds of years ago, when, in the 18th and 19th centuries, when women, women were trying to get the vote, the suffragettes trying to get suffrage or the vote for women, there were men. There were men who organised in support of those women. There were men's groups that were supportive of women's efforts to get the vote. In the 1970s, in the second wave of feminism, again, there were anti-sexist or feminist men's groups um, taking part in that effort. They weren't in huge numbers or anything, but they were part of that work. And feminists have long called for men to take part in their efforts to end gender inequalities. Bell Hooks, the famous African-American feminist, wrote in 1984 that men were comrades in struggle. Andrea Dworkin, the radical feminist, who some of you may know is a kind of you know, very scary radical feminist, but Andrea Dworkin, you know, spoke to conferences of men, again, inviting men to be part of this work. But beginning in the early, uh, beginning in the mid-90s or so, there was a real increase, a real increase in these efforts to engage men, in um, engage men in building gender equality. And you saw that in a number of fields, in the field of violence against women, in the field of HIV AIDS, in the field of maternal and child health, uh, and the field of fatherhood and parenting. And particularly internationally, particularly in the global south or developing countries, there was growing attention to engaging men, engaging men in preventing violence, engaging men in stopping HIV transmission, and so on. So it was a real increase in programming, programming, and so on. There was also an increase in international commitments. And various international bodies in the 90s made commitments 
about the need to engage men in this work. Um, the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, the Beijing Platform for Action, um, and so on. So there's now a whole lot of program and policy on men's roles in building gender equality. And this, um, this shift is part of um, a, a kind of broader range of social shifts in the last few decades. Um, social shifts to do with how gender and sexuality are understood and to do with debates over men's roles in particular. So we've seen um, an uneven progress towards gender equality in countries, um, you know, countries in England and else, countries such as England and elsewhere. And part of the, these shifts has been a growing debate about men and men's roles. Um, there's been increasingly visible public debates about men and masculinity. And just to give you an example of that, here are two magazine covers, one from the US, one from, um, I think, the UK, both about men. So on the left, man up, the traditional male is an endangered species. It's time to rethink masculinity. On the right, um, you know, the cover proclaims the end of men, um, how women are taking control of everything, apparently. So there's debate, increasingly visible debate, about men's roles and so on. Um, and there are also kind of popular discourses of male feminism, particularly, I'd say, this century, particularly in the last 15 years or so, there's been the proliferation of discussions about men and feminism, whether men can be feminists, men's roles in feminism, and so on. And one, one place I've seen this is the kind of memes that circulate about male feminists. So it's, hands up if you've ever seen this, the kind of Ryan Gosling male feminist stuff. So Ryan Gosling is a, is a, a, a US actor, uh, and these kind of memes about his support for feminism have been doing the rounds of the internet. So on the left, hey girl, let's smash patriarchy. On the right, hey girl, my perfect Saturday is a hot cup of tea at sunrise, a trip to the farmer's market, and curling up, curling up on the couch to figure out Bell Hook's theory that feminism is a struggle to eradicate the ideology of domination that permeates Western culture with you. So, you know, this kind of seductive, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, sort of heterosexual uh, male celebrity, um, you know, sort of invested in feminism. And in fact, high profile men's support for feminism, I think, has never been more visible. So, you may recognise this guy, Tom Hanks, again, you know, speaking in support of feminism. Our watch is a national violence prevention organisation in Australia, but they've just picked up on this quote of his. And perhaps the most kind of prominent male feminist, every thinking woman's crumpet, apparently, Justin Trudeau. Um, so, you know, Justin Trudeau, I think, last year said we shouldn't be afraid of the term of the word feminist, and very, I think, comfortably and boldly um, uh, claiming this term for himself. And something else that I think captured the headlines was when he appointed his new cabinet in Canada, I think, last year, it was 50% female, and someone asked him, why did you appoint a cabinet that was 50% female? He said, because it's 2015. You know, this kind of just a sort of matter-of-fact acceptance of gender equality. Lastly, there have been kind of high-profile campaigns. High-profile campaigns try to engage men in this work. Now, there are others, but perhaps one of the most visible ones is He for She. And He for She is a United Nations campaign, a UN campaign, which was launched by the actress Emma Watson um, in 2014. And He for She invites men to join with women as male allies. It asks men to pledge to pledge to take action against all forms of violence and discrimination faced by women and, women and girls. And it's been taken up in various countries. So what do we think of this turn to men? This turn to men, this, this increasing, increasingly visible emphasis on the role that men can play in gender equality. I think there are some really good things about it. One is, it, it says that gender injustice, gender inequality is a problem of men, and men have to play some role in the solution. And I think that makes sense in the same way that if the problem is, say, racism, then we probably think that white people should you know, take part in efforts to address racism and address their own racist attitudes and address wider racist um, inequalities and so on. The same is true for men and gender inequalities. Um, the same is true for heterosexual people and um, discrimination faced by lesbians and gays and um, uh, other queer categories. So it's, it makes, I think it makes powerful sense. So one thing that's good about it is it's kind of logic about the privilege group needing to address that privilege. Second thing that's good about it, I think, is it actually generates programs and policies. It generates practical things that, in this case, men can do. And there's a kind of increasingly visible advice about sharing domestic labour, about, tr about um, practising sexual consent, about fostering gender equality in workplaces and so on. So it gives men practical steps for change. And in fact, I've been collecting 
um, a sort of growing range of articles about how men can support feminism. And some of them have some pretty decent advice about what men can do in their own lives and in the worlds around them and so on. So I think it's good in some ways. Um, but um, it's also limited in some ways. This turn to men is risky or dangerous in some ways. So one is about praise. So it's certainly clear that um, men will often receive praise and status out of all proportion to their efforts. And so, for example, male celebrities in the US who say even the most basic thing about men and gender equality get showered with praise, whereas women who've been saying this stuff for years get ignored. And in fact, um, there is a kind of excessive praise and attention given to men doing this work. And maybe that's understandable because it's, it's kind of novel, it's unusual, but it also can be problematic. And it represents a kind of playing out of gender socialisation, which women are taught to reflect men at twice their natural size. Um, second, some of these campaigns don't ask very much of men. And in fact, I think he for she um, is guilty of this, that much of he for she uh, you know, doesn't actually ask very much of men. Now, the campaign does try to engage men as agents of change to achieve gender equality. It encourages them to take action. But if you actually look at the campaign online, the action doesn't take much more time than, where's the mouse? Click. I'm done. So you just, you know, you click on the pledge. You click on the red button that says, I pledge a, I pledge a commitment here. And it doesn't ask much more of men. Now, some aspects of the Heath Sheep campaign are more substantial and involve institutions in change. But um, I'm certainly concerned about um, you know, how, much of, uh, uh, how much actually um, he or she asks of men. And second, some of the he or she language, there are criticisms that it individualises sexism. It's, it makes it seem as if sexism is a problem just of individual behaviour, rather than addressing men's collective responsibility for cultures and systems of inequality. Some people argue too that he or she is somewhat paternalistic somewhat protectionist, uh, kind of protectionist, men should get involved to protect their women, to protect their wives and daughters. And there's been criticism of appealing to men only in terms of concern for the women and girls they know. We should have respect and care for all women and girls, you know, because of their sort of fundamental uh, human rights. Um, and finally, um, there's been some criticism from feminist bloggers and activists that we spend too much time reassuring men, too much time appeasing them. It's not you. It's the other bad men. You're one of the good guys. We kind of reassure men. Make, you know, we bend over backwards to make sure that men don't feel threatened. A feminist blogger, uh, feminist blogger called Belja writes, for example, about how some campaigns softly stroke men's foreheads, focus on how hard it is for men to constantly reassure, reassure men that not, they're not part of the problem. So I'm delighted, for sure, to see a growing public conversation about the roles men can play in building gender equality. It's kind of been an agenda I've been pushing for some time. But let's make sure we're involving men in real change, in, uh, as part of real efforts to shift what are widespread and systemic gender inequalities. So I'm going to spend the last section of this talk on kind of getting practical. What can men actually do? How can men build gender equality? What role should men play? What traps should they avoid? So, here's a list. And it's a list um, out of a report I wrote called Men Speak Up. And Men Speak Up is readily available online. Um, and the first thing it says is, look, if you're a man who wants to play some role in building gender equality, or that report is focused on violence against women, but the issues are still, um, still relevant, the first thing you need to do is look at yourself. You need to put your own house in order. You need to make sure that you are trying, as far as you can, to behave in uh, respectful and gender equitable ways. We have to start with ourselves, look at our own behaviour, in the bedroom, in the kitchen, on the street, and so on. We have to um, challenge other men's sexism. We have to be, in other words, pro-social bystanders. Men are often bystanders to other men's sexism. So, for example, um, I was travelling on a plane earlier this year, just a domestic flight, um, and I was, uh, I was in the middle seat, and there was a uh, guy next to me was sitting on the aisle, and the flight attendant walks past, and she kind of bent over to do something with her trolley, and he nudged me and said, check that out. Okay, like, you know, look at this woman's ass. Now, he, we hadn't exchanged a single word at that point, but he thought, I can reliably bond with this other man by objectifying uh, you know, the female flight attendant on the plane. I was so thrown by that, I didn't know what to say, and I thought what he said wasn't okay, and he shouldn't be objectifying her in that way. And it took me a minute or two to say, she's just doing a job. 
you know, to kind of say, look, I don't want to go along with you. But we we rarely do that. I think. We rarely intervene in the kind of everyday dripping tap of sexism that we see around us from other men, uh, indeed from women. So challenging other men's and uh, you know, uh, challenging uh, men's and women's sexism is really valuable. Listening to women is important. Um, and uh, reading, reading women's words or listening to women's stories and giving value and time to women's accounts of their lives and so on. We have to look at what we pay for, what we fund. And it's very, very easy to consume media, uh, music, um, porn, uh, online materials that show women and girls in degrading and hostile and callous ways. Um, and we have to think about you know, what, what we want to consume, what, what, what we want to shape our lives. We can be gender just role models for the people around us, whether you're coaching the local, local football team or taking care of your nephew or you know, with your mates and so on. We have to think about who we vote for and who we put into power. Um, there's all kinds of ways to educate ourselves by coming to guest lectures, by watching films, by reading articles and books about feminism and so on. Um, and there's giving time, money and so on, volunteering and donating to organisations doing this kind of work. These kinds of personal change are important, but they won't be enough. They won't do enough. We also have to take up collective forms of advocacy. Oh, this is a cartoon I like. So what is my role as a man in feminism? Simply put, your role is to listen to women's concerns, challenge your male privilege, and hold other men accountable. I thought that was pretty good, actually. I thought Superman should get on. Um, we also need collective change. We need collective advocacy and activism to, you know, because really what we're talking about here is systemic and structural inequalities. We're not talking about trivial, um, you know, trivial things that are easy to move. We're talking about entrenched patterns of behaviour, entrenched patterns of advantage and disadvantage. So we need concerted and collective action. Now, there are some easy mistakes to make, and, you know, confession time, I've made every single one of these mistakes in, you know, trying to be a man living in support of feminism. So one is to walk the walk, one is to talk the talk, but not walk the walk, to kind of learn the language and the rhetoric of feminism, but actually fail to live it out in one's own um, life. And I suppose we should expect that there'll often be a gap between what we say and what we do. It's hard to make personal change, but certainly we want to close that gap. Another kind of classic, um, classic trap is to um, expect women to educate us. Oh, can you, feminist woman, teach me and educate me so that I can be a better man? Well, you know, no, you need to do the work yourself. You need to do the work yourself of finding out how gender inequality works and what you can do about it. Then there's the kind of expecting praise, expecting praise from women for refraining from sexism. We shouldn't expect that women will give us a biscuit, give us a cookie every time we behave like a decent human being. <coughs> Um, okay, so, some final words. We're not going to see much progress towards gender equality without, I think, significant change among men, almost by definition, really. And the women in this room, the women in this room are probably growing up with confident expectations of gender equality. You probably expect to have the same rights and opportunities as the men around you. But in fact, you won't. You won't have those. You won't have gender equality um, unless and until men change too. So men, men who care for women, men who care for justice, men who care for the well-being of our communities have to act, have to act to gender inequalities. And if they do, if men do, we will benefit. If we can make progress, women will have better lives, and so will men. So I ask women, ask the women, expect more of men, actually. Demand more of men. Raise the bar for what it means to be a good bloke, a nice, you know, a nice guy. And men, get your house in order. Start doing that personal work. Start living every day as if gender equality really mattered. But beyond that, make noise and make trouble. Join the groups and the movements dedicated to building gender equality. Become an activist. 